In general, creativity, including musical creativity, including mathematical creativity, including creativity in any domain, uh, is the ability to generate ideas that are new, surprising, and valuable. And new has two meanings here. And the most important one is new to the person themselves, new to the person who's come up with the idea. Now, it may also be, so far as we know, new to human history. And that's the sort of newness that gets into the history books. But the uh, fundamental sort of newness is psychological newness, where it's new to the person concerned. And to understand creativity, we need to understand that. Uh, and then un, uh, finding out which ones are historically new is, is another matter, involves different questions. So new has two meanings. Surprising has three meanings. Come to that in a moment. The three sorts of surprise, I think, that are involved with creativity. And I can't tell you how many meanings valuable has, because it has indefinitely many. Maybe not an infinite number, but it's certainly an indefinitely large number, because value is a social notion, uh, value is assigned to things, uh, ideas, artifacts, musical compositions by social groups, and social groups differ in the values that they give. Um, so, as I'll say right at the end, uh, I think that science might, um, possibly neuroscience, possibly evolutionary psychology, combination of those, might be able to explain why we have certain values but it couldn't justify them. In principle, it could never justify them. Uh, that's not a scientific question. Uh, but the question about how new ideas are generated, I think, is a scientific question. And I think we're beginning to get uh, the outlines of some answers. And basically, I think there are three very general sorts of answer. In other words, there are three sorts of creativity. And I call them combinational, exploratory, and transformational. And the three sorts of surprise that I talked about map onto those sorts of creativity. So what is combinational creativity? Combinational creativity uh, is actually the only one that people talking about creativity normally talk about. If you ask somebody what creativity is, how it's possible, how it happens, if they're prepared to give you any answer rather than saying it's a complete mystery and nobody knows, um, they're liable to say that it involves um, unfamiliar combinations of familiar ideas. And there are many things that we regard as creative which do involve unfamiliar combinations of familiar ideas. Um, it's particularly important in certain sorts of poetry. Um, so there is such a thing as combinational creativity, there's no question about that. Um, and it gives you the sort of surprise, I call it statistical surprise. It's something which, once you think about it, well, you know, you know it could have happened, but you never expected it. It's very unusual. And when it happens, you're surprised for that reason, a bit like the outsider winning a horse race. Um, and I think that in music, in general, it isn't very important. It's nowhere near as important in music, I would say, as it is in poetry. Um, but it certainly does happen. There are many, many examples. I mean, one example would be putting the stars of Bach and jazz together, as the Swingle Singers did, for example. Another example would be using cellos for yesterday as Lennon and McCartney did, because cellos weren't normally used for that sort of music. They certainly weren't expected. Um, and that was part of the reason why they, they used them. And another example, which of course is a, a musical joke, is um, Dudley Moore's uh, Beethoven ending. Has anybody heard that? Oh, nobody's heard it. Well, that's a shame. I don't know if it's available on Google. If so, try and, try and get it. Uh, he, he was playing the piano, and he played a, a very brief melody, and then he came to the end you know, with a, a usual sort of ending that you get in Beethoven. But then just as it got towards the end of that, 
he starts in another one, another ending that you get in Beethoven. This went on and on and on and on. There are at least a dozen of them. Um, so that was an example of combination of creativity. But as you can see, I mean, very funny, very enjoyable. Once you hear it, you can never forget it. But not very serious, not very musically important. Um, and I don't think that's an accident. I think the other two sorts of creativity um, are much more important in music than combinational creativity is. And actually, I think they're much more important in other uh, domains too, um, in general. Now, ex exploratory creativity is a matter of taking a style of thinking. It may be a style, a way of thinking about a certain uh, family of chemical molecules, or it may be a way of thinking about a certain sort of music, like fugue or sonata, for example, or a certain sort of jazz, okay? You pick up that style from your culture. You do not make it up yourself, okay? The musician doesn't make it up themselves. It's there in the culture. Sometimes it's not in the musician's own culture. It's borrowed from another culture. But even in that case, the point is the style itself is there, right? And that way of thinking, uh, in this case about music, is taken up by the creative person, by the musician, um, as if you like a set of rules, like a generative grammar, which uh, gives you constraints, rules, but they're also, of course, opportunities, possibilities. They give you possibilities for coming up with new things that fit into that style. And so another fugue, another sonata, um, or in painting another impressionist painting or another post-impressionist painting, whatever the style is that you're interested in. And there, the sort of surprise, I think, that you have is the sort of surprise you have when you, uh, you come across something new which you hadn't realized was possible. You hadn't expected it, although once you see it immediately, you can see that it fits in to what you're used to. You, know, you could have expected it, you just didn't. Um, and you can see its familiarity to the other things in that style, to the other structures in that style. And because I've said the culture already values that style, okay, uh, the new items will be valued also because they fit into that style. So whether, whatever it is that a certain social group is finding valuable about the style, that will apply to the examples of exploratory creativity too. Um, and I would say that, oh, I don't know, perhaps 95% of what professional, for that matter, amateur, uh, artists, musicians, scientists do, right? 95% of what they do uh, is either combinational or exploratory creativity. And in music, I've said I think it's uh, very much more exploratory creativity than combinational creativity because the notion of structure is so relatively clear in music. I don't mean it's easy to say what the structure it is. I mean musicologists have been trying for years and years and years and they've got a, you know, they've got a very interesting distance but they certainly haven't got the, the full distance. So I'm not suggesting it's easy but I am suggesting that there is something relatively clear um, about it if you compare it with, for example, um, the criteria for a particular style of poetry, for instance, or painting. Um, so I've said 95% of what creative people do is combinational and exploratory. What's the other 5%? The other 5% is transformational creativity. And in transformational creativity, uh, I think it grows out of, it follows exploratory creativity. Because in exploratory creativity, what the person is doing, sometimes very consciously and deliberately, is exploring the potential of that particular space of possibilities. 
that particular style, and pushing at the constraints to see just how, just what can and interestingly what can't be generated within that style. And I think if you go, you can't do this so well with music because music is temporal. If you go to see a retrospective exhibition of a painter, and if the canvases are hung chronologically along the walls, which they often are, you can see this happening. You can see a style being pushed, explored, tried out, and if the painter is one of the people who has made a transformational change in his work during his life, which not all famous painters have, and most people who have done it have only done it once. I mean, there are a tiny number of people of whom Picasso was one, who did it more than once, but usually you're lucky if you see it only once. So you see this on the wall, and then you see what happens next is that the painter will spend the next N years, where N may go up to his death, exploring that style and trying to find out what can and can't be done there. Now, transformational creativity grows out of that when the, uh, the person, whether it's a composer or whether it's a painter, when the, the, the person drops or alters, changes one or more of the defining constraints in some way, so that structures can now be generated which were impossible before. They could not have been generated without dropping or altering that constraint. I mean, in music, the obvious example is Schoenberg, where you drop the notion of the tone key, of the, of the home key. You drop the notion of tonality and go to chromaticism. Um, but actually, exploratory and uh, transformational creativity aren't always very easy to distinguish. I don't mean by that that if you consider a particular piece of music, for example, it's difficult to say, is it exploratory or is it transformational or is it combinational? Because these distinctions I've made, these three distinctions, they're analytical distinctions, and a particular uh, piece of music, or for the, map, the painting on the wall, a particular piece of music may, may fit all, uh, more than one of them. So for example, I gave you the example before of um, mixing uh, jazz and Bach, and I said that was an example of combinational creativity. Yes, but it's also, of course, an example of exploratory creativity because those two, those two styles are being explored together. Now, the trouble with distinguishing between exploratory and transformational creativity is, in order to do that, you have to decide on if you like, the limits of the style, what you're going to call um, a style and what you're going to, to call a transformational change as opposed to a tweaking, a pushing of the constraints, which I've already said happens anyway in exploratory creativity or in much exploratory creativity. And um, just mention a, a, a couple of examples here. One is a very simple one. Um, is there anybody in this hall who's seen the latest James Bond film, the one called Skyfall? Right, well you will know that that starts out in a very, very surprising way. And to me personally, and I wonder if the same is true for you, a very disappointing, very frustrating way. Namely, that iconic opening of a James Bond film and have there been 20 or 30, it's either 20 or 30 that there have been, every single one has had the same musical opening. It hasn't had all the same images, but the James Bond theme, which I think is a very attractive one anyway, and one is used to it, one expects it. It doesn't happen. You're sitting there in the cinema, or in your, and you're, you're waiting for it, and it doesn't happen. And um, you're very, very aware of the fact and you, you start sort of forgetting about it as the film goes on, and the film is nearly over, um, really nearly over. And you hear a couple of notes. <laughs> 
um, which don't quite fit with the rest of the music that you're hearing. But you ha and then, you know, a couple of minutes later, not immediately afterwards, you hear another couple of notes, and they sort of remind you of the James Bond film. And then, a couple of minutes later, maybe you hear a phrase or half of a phrase, and then you begin to get the point, and you realize what is happening. And by the time you get to the end of the film, the whole James Bond theme is being played just as you wanted it to be played right at the beginning, okay? Only it's very gradually brought in in this way towards the end, in a very clever way. Now, are you going to call that exploratory creativity or are you going to call it transformational creativity? Uh, I mean, I'll give you my answer in a moment, but just let me give you the reasons for the one and the other. The reasons for saying it's transformational creativity uh, would be that it is very, very different from what you were expecting. Indeed, it was silence initially, and then it was just a couple of odd notes that you hardly noticed, never mind recognized, and so on. So it's very different in those ways. Um, but the reasons for calling it exploratory creativity, and this actually would be my choice, but whether you'd agree, the reasons for calling it exploratory creativity are that it's clearly in some reasonably stable, clear sense, the very same thing that you were expecting. Only it's sort of played backwards. Well, it's not just played backwards, because as I've said, it's not, it's not as though you've got the perfect theme and at the end it's played backwards because you've just got a couple of notes here and a couple of notes there and so on. So it is, it is changed. It isn't exactly the same thing, but it is very, very clear. And by the time you get to the close of the film, it's absolutely clear that it's the same thing. Uh, it's the same theme. It's being played in the same way. It isn't even like a musical inversion at that point. Um, so... Personally, I would want to call that a relatively adventurous sort of exploration. I wouldn't want to call it transformation. Now, take one other example. Um, take Brahms. You know, by the time you get to Brahms, take a Brahms piano piece, you could have six modulations into quite distant harmonies within a single bar, right? Six, and, of course, at the beginning of tonality, you wouldn't have had a modulation at all. You would have the home key and that's it. And then people started um, having one modulation into a harmonically close key, but then coming straight back again to the home key for the end. And then they became more and more um, prolific and more and more adventurous in terms of A, the number of modulations before you get to the end, and B, the harmonic distance allowed with these uh, modulations compared with the home key. And by the time you get to Brahms, as I say, you may have half a dozen within one bar. Now, if that had happened, sorry, if nobody had done any modulation, or maybe only one modulation into the, the tonic, if nobody had done any modulation before Brahms, and then Brahms comes along and gives you six in a bar, I think one would be very, very tempted to call that a transformation. A musical transformation, very, very different sort of music. Um, but because, partly because it happened so gradually over a couple of centuries or more, um, it, was, it looked like increasingly adventurous exploration of the space of tonality, right? Relative to that style, um, it was, in, as I say, increasingly adventurous exploration in a clear series. And in Charles Rosen's book on Schoenberg, if anybody's read that very interesting book, and he says, it. Um, atonality was absolutely inevitable. It didn't have to be Schoenberg, could have been somebody else, but it was absolutely inevitable. 
because there was an internal logic here to the structural changes that were going on, such that by the time you got to people like Brahms and the people, you know, contemporaries of Schoenberg, the home key was just a musical fig leaf. It was just a convention. It wasn't doing any musical work. Right? The whole of the uh, inside of the, of the composition you know, really wasn't taking any notice of the home key, and it was just right at the end it came back to the home key because that was what was done. And Rosen says it was absolutely inevitable for that reason um, that somebody at some point would just drop that convention altogether and say, don't let's concentrate on seven notes, let's concentrate on 12. Uh, so to decide in any particular case whether a particular musical change, a musical novelty, um, is exploratory or transformational, isn't always easy. And it's going to depend on not only a very careful and detailed analysis of what's going on in that uh, composition, and it's uh, the relationship between it and previous styles, um, but also you know, historical knowledge and, uh, and so on. So these aren't, aren't simple matters. But the point is that the, uh, the notion of a generative system, of psychological processes, coming up with hierarchical structures and new hierarchical structures by following an already existing set of rules is something that in general we understand very well. And we understand it largely, well, thanks to mathematics and of course thanks to computing. And in terms of associative memory, which is what combinational creativity is primarily concerned with, again, we've got the beginnings of some ideas about just precisely how that happens, not just what is happening, but how that happens. We've got the beginnings of some good ideas about that. Um, but I have to, uh, if you like, in a sense, disagree with my chairman here, because you said that um, if you want to understand how creativity can happen from the cognitive point of view. Neuroscience, you said neuroscience is one of the things that's going to help us. Well, in principle, maybe, certainly not at the moment, because neuroscience isn't asking the right questions. At best, neuroscience at the moment and in the very near future can only tell us a little bit, it can only tell us a little bit about combinational creativity. It can tell us something about how it is that associations between certain neurons take place and, um, and certain sorts of neural activation can lead to other sorts of neural activation, but it can't do that um, in any detail. It can't even take something as um, almost contentless as the cello and yesterday example I gave you and explain how that could happen. And if you want to pick out uh, one of the many, many amazing um, images in Shakespeare uh, and ask, well, what's neuroscience underlying that? We haven't got the beginnings of an idea. So neuroscience at the moment can hardly help us at all, even about combinational creativity, and it certainly can't help us with the other two. Why? Because neuroscience has no idea yet uh, how generative structures, sorry, how hierarchical structures are represented in the brain and how they're manipulated in various ways, like, for example, inversion, um, putting in a negative to a particular constraint. I mean, there are all sorts of examples in, in many domains of creativity, transformational creativity, uh, where what's going on is that a constraint is either dropped or negated or other things are happening. And we haven't got the beginnings of an idea how that happens in neuroscience. And they don't even realize they should be asking those questions, I think, because if you try and talk to a neuroscientist about creativity, they'll try and talk about combinational creativity because they don't recognize the other two. So there's lots of work to be done and there's lots to be learned. Um, but I suggest that if you want to think about musical creativity, don't think primarily in terms of uh, unfamiliar associations of familiar ideas, although as I said, that does happen. Think more 
about what indeed the musicologists have been thinking of all along. Hierarchical structures, um, certain sorts of musical structures that we're familiar with, how they relate to one another, and how they gradually, or in some cases almost overnight, turn into another but related structure. So you have impossibilist surprise, which is the sort that really, really gets you into the history books. I'll stop there. Thank you, Margaret. Sound? Uh, all right.